Yep, exactly. Well, and even your account type. Yeah. Okay. Like, I, that's, checking that's in and making through. sure is that still, yeah, like a couple, a couple of clients, you know, if, if a lot of banks have, you know, youth accounts or student accounts and they go up to a certain age. So if you're someone like me, where an account was open when you're three, well, you can have that until you're 18 and then they're going to change it to a different account right. type. And maybe you're paying way more in service fees than you should. So it's really important, or maybe you shouldn't be paying them at all and it should be changed to a student account. So there's, you know, you have to check in on that stuff and it's worth it. It's worth knowing, you know, what you have and what you need. Oh my gosh. If somebody was like, oh, well, I'm paying $7 a month now. Um, what does that matter? It's like, oh gosh, this just adds up. And at, the, at some point I'm like, well, if you're paying $7 a month and you're a student for four years and you could have that waived, like, wouldn't you rather have anything other than bank fees? <laughs> anything other than seven times That's 12. like a coffee from Starbucks a month. <laughs> yes. Like <laughs> just anything. Um, okay. So I would love to run down just a few um, bank accounts and what are the differences? So we'll do a little bit of bank rapid fire, but you don't have to be rapid fire in your answers if, if it doesn't do. So bank accounts, checking versus saving. What's the difference? Yeah. So checking account is where you're going to do your day-to-day -day transactions. Typically, this is your account that you want your payroll to go into or that you're putting your income into. And it's kind of the spot where, yeah, you need a coffee, you want your gas, your day-to-day, your -day, everything kind of, that's where you plunk that money. Savings, on the other hand, um, I mean, people, some people have multiple savings accounts. So you, you like, depending on how you budget, you might have three savings accounts, right? And this one is for fun money and this one is for rainy day or whatever. But essentially, it's just an account to take money out of that everyday spending where it could kind of get lost and move it to keep it separate. So it's a really great budgeting tool. Or for some people, it's just where they put excess or whatever money that they're not needing for their everyday day to day banking. It's a way to kind of separate it. The other thing, too, is a checking account typically would have a monthly fee. Um, some of them have monthly fee waivers, depending on the balance of your account. That's another situation. But savings accounts typically don't have a monthly fee. However, you don't want to be withdrawing from them because guaranteed they're going to be charging you like five bucks or more for withdrawals from those accounts. So anything like if you're at, you know, Safeway buying groceries, you don't want to buy it from your savings account because you're going to get charged five dollars for that transaction, most likely. A lot of banks, there's not a fee if you transfer money. So let's say you had money in your savings account that you ended up needing for your oil change or whatever. You can online or with your mobile app transfer money over to your checking account and use it from there. But you don't want to make purchases or things directly from the savings account. Okay, that's that's great. Um, can you, like, I know that the answer two years ago would have been no, but uh, now when we see kind of higher interest rates, uh, is there um, ever interest rate? Like, um, could they earn interest on either type of account? Yeah. Yeah, sorry. So a lot of savings, it's, it's very minuscule, honestly, even with the changes that have happened to interest rates, savings on or interest rates that you earn on a t just general savings account are very, very low, but checkings accounts, you don't earn interest on those accounts. So you're going to earn a little baby bit. They're going to, you know, kind of reward you for keeping money in there and keeping it separate. But um, yeah, you, you typically do. Some accounts, you don't start earning interest until you've met a minimum balance. So for example, a savings account, you might have thousand dollars in it really depends on your bank. So banks have the same products, but they're smidgy smidge different with each thing that the features that they have on them cool so then relating back to well i'm going to keep going because i feel like all of mm -hmm. this would likely come up when you tell the financial advisor your your story and your history and what you're saving for and they would help kind of right. like recommend certain things but in order to make right. it a relationship understanding what these different types are kind of can help okay um mm -hmm. so now we have banking accounts we know the difference between checking and savings then we also have kind of more investment accounts. So we have regular accounts, non-tax sheltered, but then we also hear about tax-free savings accounts, TFSA, and RSP, Registered Retirement Savings Plans. So all of these yeah. um, have the word savings in them, and yet 
people don't just save in these accounts. So can you please tell me the difference between what a regular non-tax tax sheltered, a TFSA and an RRSP are? Yeah, so the the features of the account are different, but otherwise they're basically the same kind of thing. So I'll just um, kind of bulk a TFSA and RSP in the same kind of registered group first. Uh, the, the best way I found explaining these accounts to people was to think of it like a house. So the tax-free savings account is a house, the RSP is a house. So in a house, you have different rooms. You have your bathroom, you have your kitchen, you have your bedroom, and you do different things in those rooms. That's what a TFSA is. It's the whole house. So within that TFSA, you can have different rooms in there. Whereas with your regular checking or savings, it's just, it is what it is. It's a checking account or it's a savings account. So RSP, TFSA are different because you have different investment options available to you in those different rooms. So for example, in a TFSA, you might have a GIC room where you have, you know, guaranteed investment certificates, which is a type of investment product or mutual fund portfolios, which is another type of investment product, or just, I would call it the lobby of the house, just a cash component where you're just plunking in cash. So even though I it's an investment stocks. account, can stock yeah. go in there? <laughs> you can have a stock room, <laughs> but yeah, so it has different spaces within that one account. So that's kind of think of an RSP TF to say those are like houses and the rooms you have different options so that's one way that they're different from a regular savings account the next thing rsp is a tax deferred uh type of savings account so the main purpose for rsp the reason it was brought out was for retirement savings just like it says in the name what happens is it's going to defer the taxes that you pay based on your contributions so everybody has different contribution limits depending on their previous year's income. So that's gonna look different for everybody. Um, but basically what happens, we'll just use really round numbers cause math, <laughs> but basically like, let's say you made a hundred thousand dollars and you put $5,000 into an RSP. When you do your taxes, you're gonna be doing it on $95,000. However, when you take that 5,000 out, hopefully later in the future, because you don't want it to bump you up into the next tax bracket, you're gonna be taxed at hopefully a lower amount. So not right now, you don't pay taxes now, you're gonna pay it later when you withdraw it, which is really important to remember <laughs> because I can't tell you how many times people would come in to do withdrawals from their RSPs and there's something called withholding tax where the bank will basically claw back a portion. So if you're saying, you know, I wanna withdraw 5,000, we'd ask you net or gross, because we might have to withdraw, I don't know, 7,000 to get out the actual amount that you need because of withholding tax. So RSP main purpose, main focus of that was for retirement. It's not how everybody used it. Um, they also had a feature that's changing this year. They're coming out with a new account, um, but you could use it towards a down payment of a house. Um, with the home buyers plan. Now, I'm not super familiar with the new account that's coming out, but it's along the same lines of what the RSP did with a down payment for buying your first house. So RSP, just think retirement. It, that's really what it's for. Set it, forget it. It's really just for retirement is the main function. Kind of get in a scenario where a lot of people think everybody needs an RSP and that's not necessarily... Um, true. It's very different for everyone. And, and to get the actual benefits of it, for example, if you're a, a lower income earner, you're maybe not going to reap the rewards of deferring taxes because you're going to pay taxes on it later anyway. So it's just paying it later versus bumping you down a, a tax bracket. And actually, like, ideally, your investment would grow in there. So you put in 5000 mm -hmm. and in seven years, hopefully it's 10000 so then you, yeah. you are like a lower income earner and you put away money and then it ends up just instead of paying tax on whatever that 5,000 is this year, then you're paying tax on the $10,000 in the future. You might actually be putting yourself in a tax disadvantage, which is why having yeah. those conversations with a financial advisor that you trust and, um, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, finding that relationship and um, figuring out and also understanding what the purpose of these vehicles are. So if you are a low mm -hmm. income earner, um, 
there is maybe like, I want to know a little bit more about the TFSA and, and understand how that works. Yes. Yeah. So the tax-free savings account is a tax sheltering account. So what that means is the money that you put in is after tax dollars. So you're not going to get the same deduction like you would an RSP. If you made a hundred thousand dollars, you're going to, if you put in 5,000 in a TFSA, you're paying taxes on hundred thousand still. So it doesn't give you that tax deferral. The benefit of the tax-free savings is that let's say you put that 5,000 in and it grows and, and you're earning income on it. You don't have to, or sorry, you're, you've earned interest or it's grown and, and you have more money in the account now. You don't have to pay taxes on that growth. So back to regular savings account we talked about in the first place, you'd have to put an astronomical amount of money in to really get a, a good amount of interest on that. But I believe it's about $50 of interest is where they you get your T5 slip and you pay taxes on it, right? But um, yeah. basically what happens is in a regular regular savings account, once you've earned so much interest, it's essentially considered like income and you get a tax slip and you have to claim it in your taxes and pay tax on it. Tax-free savings account, let's say you put in your 5,000 and you know by the end of the year you invested it well and now it's worth 7,000, that 2,000 is tax sheltered. So you're not gonna be putting it in your um, taxes that you've earned that $2,000. So it shelters it. It's a really great account for anything, honestly. Um, I've seen people use that account for saving for down payments, for saving for trips, just nothing like rainy day savings, like anything you really want to save for, that can be a really good account to do that in. Um, it's not quite as liquid as a savings account, like just a regular savings account that you have with your checking in the sense that you can't, you know, use your debit card to pay for something with it or quite as easily access the money, especially if it's invested. So it can be a bit of a deterrent to take money out as well, which can be really beneficial for people. Um, Tax-free savings accounts have contribution limits that are unique to you based on your age. So the account was created in 2009. So if you were 18 before 2009, you have the um, contribution room since 2009 that you could put in, which up to this year is 88,000. So they've been different amounts, <laughs> random amounts. Uh, this year for 2023, 6,500. Last year was 6,000. We had a rogue 10,000 year. <laughs> it started out with 5,000. So it's kind of all over the place. There are calculators you can use online where you just put in the year that you turned 18 and it will tell you exactly quick and easy what your contribution room is, what you're allowed. So the year you turn 18 is the year that you start to get room. Um, so for example, let's say I turned 18 last year, the limit was 6,000, um, it's 6,500 this year, and I didn't use any of last year's room, it's going to follow me to this year. So this year I would be able to put in 2,500 because I have 6,000 from last year and 6,500 from this year. So contribution room is really important because there's penalties for over contributing. So just talk with your advisor as well. That should be something, you know, when I had a client, if they were doing contributions, I'd be like, okay, let's take a look at this and make sure that you're not, you know, that you're well within your room. Because what happens as well is you don't regain your room if you withdraw until the following year. Hmm. So let's so say, you're putting, let's in, say putting, putting in, putting in, putting out, you could yeah, exactly. You don't get the room back until next year. So if last year I put in 5,000, that means this year I'd have 1,000 still more. And then I would have the 6,500. So technically 7,500 this year. But let's say I had withdrawn, you know, another thousand last year. I wouldn't have 2,000 until next year. I'd still only have 1,000 room. So it can get a little bit tricky. It's talking it out loud. I usually have pen and paper and would like kind of write it down because these things can get tricky. So talking with your advisor and just telling them, I mean, you don't want to be using your account for just in, out, in, out kind of things, like you said. Um, but certainly there's no penalty to withdraw from the account. You just won't earn that contribution room again. Now, if you're someone who, like I say, you, you were over 18 in 2009 and you have $88,000 worth of room, you might have some wiggle room to be able to, you know, put in 5,000, take out four, put in another five, you know, because you have that room to do it. But if you're brand new to the game, just turned 18 kind of thing, 
you want to be more careful with your limits. It's interesting because um, that taking out, putting in um, and the complexity, especially if you're not familiar with it. Listen, my uh, my old boss at one of the jobs I was consulting at uh, is uh, a chartered accountant. So his whole thing was making like at a multi-billion dollar corporation. And he over coffee was kind of like, oh shit, like I over contributed for like my wife and I this year because we moved some stuff, we did this. And it was very early in the game. Um, like TFSAs were a few years out and he got like a bill for $2,000 or something. And it was like, hey, listen, like, let's just write them a letter and ask for forgiveness. And he looked at me and I was like, yeah, just write him a letter, write the check. Like, you know, I pulled up like the, the order of operations and I'm like, like, let's just, let's do this. It's worth like 20 minutes. Let's just try at yeah. worst. Like they laugh, they rip it up and they have your money. And <laughs> so, so him being like a chartered accountant, you know, that again, does this for a living, but in a different aspect, um, didn't know that you could, you know, just fast up and pay. Anyways, long story short, six months later, he finds another letter that comes in and is like, oh, thank you very much. And returned his check and said, hey, like, we understand you made oh. a mistake. Thank you for letting us know. Yeah, we'll accept um, this as a one-off. We, re we record in your file. If this happens yeah. again, you'll be charged a penalty. But so again, talking with your financial advisor, talking with people, finding out information, because um, there is a lot of good information yeah. on the internet. It's just how do you, mm -hmm. you know, communicate openly with people? Because there might be things that, you know, you, you just don't know. Yeah. So, you know, talk to talk to people. We yeah. spoke briefly.